Greetings from uh, Chile, Rhode Island. Uh, my name is Walmart James, and I'm a professor of health services policy and practice and senior advisor to the Pandemic Center at Brown University School of Public Health. Uh, welcome to everybody uh, joining us from across the world. Um, to say that today we are convening this panel to discuss the current state of vaccine manufacturing on the African continent. Um, next to developing a global network of highly skilled public health experts and upscaling surveillance and detection systems, establishing decentralized vaccine manufacturing hubs and projects is one of the most uh, compelling things to get right in preparation for the next um, pandemic, which will come at some point whilst dealing with routine immunization challenges. A recent New York Times article um, highlighted that this is no easy task at all. Uh, if I can introduce our panelists just very briefly, they have very long bios and CVs. I will just briefly say that uh, Stavros Nikolai is a senior executive um, um, responsible for strategic trade at Aspen Pharma Group. Um, Peter Hotez is the Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at the Baylor College of Medicine. And uh, Laura Dumoulin is uh, the health security lead for the World Economic Forum. Just some introductory points. COVID-19 illustrated the consequences of Africa's underdeveloped vaccine manufacturing capability. Less than 1% of all vaccines administered in Africa are produced domestically, which means 99% are not. Africa's annual vaccine demand is expected to triple to 2.7 billion doses by 2040. After a dramatic rise in vaccination rates, more recently there has been a decline. This has been global. To note that India and Brazil from the developing world currently meet most of their own vaccine demands with resi residual capacity for export. Two African firms are listed as full or partial members to the vaccine family. Uh, being the Institute Pasteur of Dakar in Senegal and BioVac in Cape Town, South Africa. And to say that Aspen Pharmacare is the most significant player from the industry side. CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness uh, Initiative, launches 100-day mission to develop and approve vaccines for novel virus, viral diseases within 100 days of the first reported case. There is no end-to-end -end man uh, vaccine manufacturing on the African continent for human use. It is for animal use. Presently, the world's busy in Africa. Algeria, Botswana, Egypt, Kenya, Morocco, Nigeria, Rwanda, Senegal, South Africa, Tunisia, and Ghana uh, are all busy with some form of uh, vaccine project. The African Medicines Agency has been, been established. It is Africa's FDA. It's based in Ghana, Rwanda. There is a major opportunity before us a small window to introduce vaccine manufacturing on the continent, but there are serious barriers and challenges that have to be solved. So with that, let me just turn to Stavros, first of all, to um, Stavros Nikolai, to give us an industry perspective on the viability of sustainable, sustainable end-to-end -end vaccine manufacturing on the African continent. I've asked him to speak for five minutes and we'll have uh, some 10 minutes of for discussion between the panelists. So over to you, Stavros. Professor James and uh, all the esteemed uh, panelists on this call, uh, colleagues and ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's indeed a great pleasure uh, to participate in this uh, webinar, uh, a, a webinar that is both uh, timely and, and critical given the discussions that are presently taking place. Uh, we've seen significant movement from the likes of Gavi, from PEPFAR, uh, and other well-known institutions and or agencies developing uh, support mechanisms, either through procurement or otherwise, uh, to achieve regional manufacturing of, of vaccines and other pharmaceuticals. Uh, Professor James uh, poses the question, what needs to be done? And uh, in the remaining four minutes, let me, let me cover four points. Uh, they're not an exhaustive list, and I'm sure other colleagues will complement and supplement what I'm about to say. But the, the first and most important element is we, we require 
sustainable and predictable demand on the continent, uh, meaning that uh, there has to be procurement in line with the African Union's uh, uh, express statements and policies. There has to be procurement uh, from African manufacturers if we are to sustain these manufacturers. How do we achieve that? We achieve that through both domestic, continental, and uh, global uh, procurement and regulatory reform. And as I indicated at the outset, there, there are some positive steps in that direction. Point number two is the regulatory reform, uh, the, the, the regulatory aspects. Uh, we require a regulatory system that is, that is integrated with uh, high degrees of mutual recognition uh, appropriate quality standards um, that are flexible enough to achieve what Africa is looking to achieve. And again, there are some regulatory reforms in, in, the, in progress. It's certainly encouraging that now five African countries, the interest of time, I won't list all of them, uh, have now achieved ML3 status. And uh, the next step here is, is ML4. And then, of course, if we achieve ML4, uh, then uh, we can uh, safely say that would be equivalent to what WHOPQ realizes in today's terms. So these are all measures aimed at improving both sustainability and efficiency, but more importantly, um, a, a sustainable and consistent demand on the continent. The, the third of my four points is, is technology partnerships. Now, Africa doesn't at this point in time have neither the capability nor capacity uh, to develop its own vaccines. R&D innovation is not at this point in time a strength for the African continent. And if we are to solve for the problem, which is achieving health security, and uh, more broadly, if we achieve health security, global peace and security, if we are to achieve this, uh, it's important that we have again sustainable uh, both commercial and and technology models um, that uh, that lend themselves to partnerships where both technologies and knowledge is transferred to local producers on the African continent in line with the voluntary licensing that we've previously experienced for example in uh, in the area of HIV AIDS and the the very last point is, speaks to uh, public-private partnerships on, on the continent. This is a, a, a continental and regional uh, challenge and constraint that we're trying to solve for. And uh, to the extent that there are any barriers that exist between the private and the public sector, those need to be broken down. Uh, where there are trust deficits, those need to be restored. And uh, we can only achieve uh, vaccine independence, vaccine equality, and uh, health security and integrity on the African continent if we have the best of both of the public and the private sector collaborating together. And that is why a webinar like today, Professor James, is so important in order to garner that confidence between the two sectors. My concluding remark is that we can only achieve global peace and security in our lifetime if we, if we uh, uh, adhere to the mantra that local, uh, local solutions and local capacity solve local problems. Mm -hmm. And that is what we are aiming to achieve uh, through these initiatives and particularly uh, in this webinar. So thanks. It's been a great pleasure sharing some thoughts with you. And I'll, I'll hand back to Professor James. Thank you very much. Um... Uh, Stavros, so um, please call me Walmart. So, <laughs> um, um, I'm old old to... habits never die. <laughs> um, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, no, I do respect that. So, but please call me Walmart. So, I wanted to invite uh, two other guest speakers to respond to uh, to Stavros, and I wanted to turn first to um, to Laura, since she is with the World Economic Forum, and Stavros raised the importance of establishing private partnerships. 
which people sort of throw at as a very easy thing to do. It's very difficult, as we know, but it's essential. Uh, vaccines are made by companies, and therefore uh, industry has to be part of the story. So I'd like to ask Laura to respond to that. Yes, thank you so much, uh, um, Wilmot and Stavros. Lovely to see you here as well, and, and wonderful comments. And yes, I do see that um, public-private partnerships really are. Um, we're seeing kind of the root of have great potential to, especially in this particular capacity and this lens, to really um, make systematic changes. So that's really what the forum has been working on um, quite a bit recently. So we work closely with Stavros and with other companies to see how we can bring together the public and the private sectors with, um, around this issue and use the neutral forum that the, that the forum offers and the creation of what we're calling the Regionalized Vaccine Manufacturing Collaborative to really think about um, how, can, how can we align, I think where there are aligned, there are aligned interests. However, how can we tease those out figure out what those are and ensure that there's kind of a momentum moving forward. So how can we have um, political, how can we have political, uh, the political momentum that we've seen around vaccine manufacturing, how can that be united with, with what um, Stavros is doing? Because we do see barriers in place, which only, whether it's in the regulatory space, whether they're trade barriers, whether they're, um, um, whether it's um, access barriers that it's within the public domain that we need to have those um, addressed and worked against. Thanks so much, Laura. I'd like to return to the regulatory architecture that we have to develop on the African continent. There's 50, 55 countries. You can't negotiate the regulatory environment with you know, when you're dealing with 55 countries, it's uh, the African Medicines Association is important, but actually having a, a infrastructure to deal with uh, medicines approval across the continent is gonna be a heavy lift. And so I'd like to return to that subject. But I first wanted to turn to, um, to Peter Hotez. Uh, there's clearly a role for the not-for-profit sector in vaccine development. Um, I said uh, companies make vaccines, so those are, established practices, but I'm sure he would like to comment on that. And in particular on the issue of access to vaccines, um, the whole problem to do with um, efficient vaccine distribution to areas where it's required um, and, and so forth. So um, over to you, Peter. Well, thank you so much. And I appreciated very much the comments of both Stavros and Laura. And, and what I'd like to do is round out this opening part of the of the webinar by giving some emotional urgency uh, to it all. You know, the I'm a vaccine scientist, and we we develop uh, vaccines for neglected diseases as well as two COVID vaccines um, for low and middle income countries that reached 100 million doses in India and Indonesia. And you know, from my perspective, I think the we we have to remember that. Um, uh, the system did not work in its current status. So the system basically says that only the multinational pharma companies have the chops to pull this off. And eventually the crumbs will filter down to the LMICs, to the low and middle income countries. And, and that was a science policy failure. And it, and it failed not only to create a humanitarian, humanitarian catastrophes in Africa and South Asia and Southeast Asia in terms of unnecessary COVID deaths, but it was not even in the enlightened self-interest of North American and European countries, because remember, Delta arose out of an unvaccinated population out of South Asia, and Omicron and its subvariants arose out of unvaccinated or under-vaccinated populations on the African continent. So, so what do you do? Uh, and I and I clearly I think the answer is um, we need to broaden the ecosystem, broaden the tent, to and and not to demonize the pharma companies either. They 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 do a lot of good. They provide a lot of innovation and a lot, even a lot of important vaccines for the Gavi Alliance. But the point is we need to do a, a, some added actors in this. And this is what I think today's discussion is about. So in our case, as a um, product development partnership at our Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development, it's co-headed by myself and 
my science partner for the last 25 years, Mary Elena Batazzi. We developed the prototype and then transferred the technology and the production cell bank uh, to four vaccine producers in LMICs and then in India, biologically made Corbivax that reached almost 100 million doses. And then in Indonesia, Biopharma produced uh, Indovac, which was one of the first halal uh, uh, COVID vaccines. So the point is we provided proof of concept that you don't have to be a big pharma company to, to still do big things. And I think there's some lessons learned um, from that model. So what do we need to do? I think, you know, clearly, um, you know, showing that, you know, putting the LNYC vaccine producers out in front can work. Um, it's not easy, but it can work. And we, you know, showed this for India and Indonesia, actually Bangladesh and even somewhat with Botswana. Um, if you look at where the need is greatest, clearly, you know, today's subject, the African continent, there's the greatest need in terms of the um, uh, fewest vaccines being made, new vaccines being made locally, but also just as a side note, I want to mention the Middle East profoundly underachieved. So the Middle East is, is not really making any new vaccines to speak of. Um, um, also, the Latin American and Caribbean countries have profoundly underachieved as well. That, that was actually a big disappointment uh, to the pandemic. And we need this for two reasons. One, to ensure vaccine equity for this and future pandemic threats. Remember, um, COVID-19 is the third major coronavirus epidemic pandemic of the century. We had SARS in 2002, MERS in 2012, now COVID-19. So the fourth one's coming. It's going to happen before the end of this decade. And we still haven't prepared for that. But also beyond the pandemic threats, the global pandemic threats are the vaccines of regional importance. And, and I'll say one more thing and then stop, which was years ago, the director of the African Regional um, office of WHO grabbed me by the arm and said, Peter, we need a Beruli ulcer vaccine. What is Beruli ulcer? Beruli ulcer is caused by mycobacterium ulcerans. It causes a horrific disfiguring condition by primarily people living in a small geographic region of, of Ghana, Togo, and, and elsewhere in, in, in West Africa. No big pharma company is going to make a vaccine for a disease of regional importance like Beruli ulcer or a schistosomiasis vaccine, which occurs 90 plus percent uh, on the African continent. So the other reason, reason beyond the pandemic threats are those diseases that are of regional but not global importance, causing horrific destruction regionally, uh, but recognizing that, that that's, that's where they're restricted. And so that's the other major aspect, I think, for vaccine production in Africa. So uh, I'll stop there and I look forward to the discussion today. So thank you very much, uh, Peter. If I can just go back to uh, Stavros to ask him what is it, what lessons were learned from Aspen Pharmacare's experience with COVID-19 and the fact that they had to actually close down a plant and a production as a result of a lack of demand. And so, so its point is making vaccines if there's no demand and take up. So those two things are joined in the hip. So if you can just reflect on, you mentioned procurement and harmonizing procurement and getting that right. Uh, in the US experience with Operation Warp Speed, we know that public sector money was used to, to de-risk the process of manufacturing by having very clear um, procurement targets um, and advanced commitments made and, and, and so on. So the economics of doing this of having not necessarily sovereign production, but at least a network of, um, um, of uh, producers on the African continent um, as a business enterprise um, requires a coherent policy when it comes to procurement, a coherent policy in terms of investment in infrastructure, including R&D and so on. So we know what's required. So, um, Aspen Pharmacare had some difficulties in terms of that experience, and there's some clear lessons to be learned. And I just wanted to ask Stavros just to reflect what one needs to be done in order to do this. I mean, I want to emphasize again, we have this opportunity. We could already see people think this, this pandemic is over and done with, you know, people are tired of talking about this. We're about to go into the same cycle of boom and bust, 
where uh, once everybody declares a COVID-19 pandemic to be over, then we lowered our guard. So, and that would be a huge mistake. So we need to get this vaccine manufacturing story right. And Africa does face that opportunity. So, uh, sorry, I've been a bit long-winded, but you, you get my question, um, uh, Stavros. Thanks, and, and I'm afraid I'm gonna disappoint you because I'm gonna continue calling you professor. Right? Um, uh, uh, Wilmot, <laughs> okay. So it took uh, took some time to get my my tongue around calling you uh, Wilmot. You you raise um, in the form of a question the the most important aspect to achieving regional sustainable regional manufacturing. In the in the instance of of Aspen, so Aspen is the largest pharmaceutical company on the African continent. We have manufacturing facilities all over the world. Uh, our flagship facility is um, in a coastal town called Kebeja, formerly Port Elizabeth in, in South Africa. And we had taken a decision as management prior to COVID uh, to expand our sterile capabilities and capacities at that facility. Uh, that facility consists of six different manufacturing units. And uh, we had in, invested uh, around $400 million there or thereabouts to expand our, our uh, sterile capacities and volumes. And, and we did so because we are the leading manufacturer and supplier of general anesthetics in the world outside of the United States. And uh, we, we had uh, these plans and uh, intentions of relocating some of our general anesthetic and, and uh, muscle blocker these muscle relaxants that you use um, when you undergo uh, surgery. We wanted to relocate those back to, to Port Elizabeth. We were well en route to do that, and in fact have done some of that re uh, relocation back to South Africa. However, when the pandemic broke, and we, we had a two months head start as Aspen in South Africa because um, we've got businesses in, in, in Europe and in, uh, in January 20, 2020, our management teams in uh, France and, and Portugal and Italy uh, were placing all these frenzied calls. And, and this was in early, in early January, uh, where most of South Africa is on, on, on leave. It's our summer break. But we were getting all these frenzied calls and they were saying, we're running out of uh, general anesthetics, there's a surge of demand. So we had an early head start and we, we saw what was coming with, uh, with uh, COVID-19 and took fairly early on during the trajectory of the pandemic, took a decision to reallocate our capacities to accommodate vaccine production. So this would be formulation full and finish, uh, I can't call it entirely a repurposing, but it was a reallocation with some repurposing of capacities so that we could help uh, Africa and the world in, in production. And uh, colleagues on this call will realize that in March and April 2020, uh, we, we didn't have the capacities uh, to sustain 10 or 15 billion doses of COVID vaccine. So there was a sudden ramp up, and, and again, I can only describe it as, as frenzied activity to try and uh, uh, acquire additional capacity around the world. And Aspen put its hand up in, in April. And cut a long story short, we got into an arrangement with Johnson & Johnson to produce the J&J &J, uh, COVID vaccine under contract manufacturing arrangements. J&J &J was the vaccine of choice for Africa, and that's primarily why we selected it. It seemed to be the most African-friendly vaccine from a logistic supply chain, demographically speaking, et cetera. And it was also a single dose at the time. So that's why we selected that particular vaccine and went into production for and on behalf of J&J, &J, eventually landed up producing 225 million doses. And uh, from being selected as partner number 10 
for J and J for contract manufacturing. I'm pleased to tell you that uh, there was quite a bit of leapfrogging that we did, and eventually um, we were the first to complete uh, of the eleven partners the technology transfer process and produce these vaccines. So that was all well and good. However, contract manufacturing does not guarantee where the product is distributed to and where it lands. And again, I'm going to spare you the, the, the details. These are things you can put in a book one day, uh, which I'll co-author with you, uh, Wilmot. Um, but there, there was a standoff between Europe and the AU in terms of where these vaccines would finally land up. And it, it took quite significant negotiating and eventually an agreement was settled between the EU and Africa um, for some of these vaccines, initially 60 and eventually 90% to be retained on the African continent. What this did in conclusion, it placed a lot of focus on licensing these vaccines to, to, to African producers. And through a collective effort of WHO, WTO, multiple players, some of whom are some of whom are on this call, we eventually, as Aspen, secured a license uh, from J and J, meaning that they licensed their, their their RP to us, and we could go ahead and then produce our own vaccine. However, that was at the point of November 2021, and demand had dropped off. And not a single uh, Aspen COVID vaccine was produced thereafter. We we called our product a Spinovax, and to date we haven't sold a single vial of a Spinovax. And that is the problem, the the challenge that Wilmot is uh, is is so uh, eloquently putting to us. So we set up after significant investment all of this capability. Uh, only to find that there was no demand. And clearly, this is unsustainable moving into the future. So what do we do about this? Just uh, as a final comment, uh, we, we have to ensure that any outbreak vaccine capacity that gets reserved, um, mm -hmm. if it's unutilized, we cannot leave the manufacturers in the lurch because they simply won't keep their doors open. We were slightly fortunate in the case of Aspen because we have a very diverse uh, product offering and we manufacture a number of products, including other sterile products. So, of course, it was a blow to us. Um, and we were slightly fortunate that we could cushion that blow. But there are many others that won't cushion the blow futuristically. And that is why we are proposing all these measures, not least of which is a sustainable demand and for African requirements for African patients to be uh, to be procured from African manufacturing facilities. So that was our single biggest learning. Or put differently, uh, un unless there is security around domestic or regional procurement, you're going to be very guarded about getting into this business ever again. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so, so Wilmot, if I could just build yes. on that comment. So, Please, uh, absolutely. Uh, by the way, what what Stavros and Aspen did was truly impressive, but it also highlights the, the the problems. And that is, you know, I think too often those who are in the pharmaceutical space don't differentiate the challenges of producing vaccines at scale compared to, say, small molecule drugs or diagnostics or medical devices in the vaccine space is quite quite different, mostly because when you're talking about far more complicated biologics, the upfront investment is, is larger, um, the time horizons are longer, um, and the, I mean, the risk, risk is high as well. So it takes a very special type of a biotech or pharma investor to, in, to invest in vaccines. And so people focus a lot on the patents. And, and in my view, that's in some ways the least of it. It's more of the capacity building uh, that can take years and years. And, 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 and so the, the point is who's going to invest in that level of capacity building because it's about how you scale it up under a quality umbrella, under quality control, quality assurance. 
unless you have some type of guarantee for advanced purchase. And, and that's where things tend to fall apart. So with our collaborators in India and Indonesia, the governments had made that agreement that they were if, if, if they built it, they would they were going to do, you know purchase it and distribute it. And that worked out very well. In the case of Bangladesh, for instance, though we we worked with a terrific company in SEPTA. They were doing great. Um, they did you know everything you could hope a, an organization would do. But at the end of the day, the Bangladeshi government just said, well, you know, we're just going to go and buy a Pfizer vaccine anyway, or or go with another purchase. And that was very demoralizing um, to to go that route. So. Um, uh, and and so you have two issues. One, the the time horizons are long with vaccines, typically, and 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 much longer than the term of an elected official. So it takes a visionary leader to want to look at five or ten year time horizons to build that capacity if you're seeking support from the government, and then to have the facility running continuously. So it's it's providing vaccines and. And in my view, those are two of the biggest challenges beyond the regulatory hurdles, which we can talk about. So you raise a very important point about politics, which is what's required is a custodian, an institutional custodian for dealing with the most important therapies um, and vaccines both for routine use and also for pandemic response, which requires a scale up and scale down operation that's very dynamic. Um, and that custodian cannot be elected officials. That is, elected officials are really important, but they change all the time. So you need a standalone body that actually encapsulates the vision you just um, outlined. And most countries don't have that. And so that's one of the most important institutional innovations I think that ought to happen. But let me just say that um, there has been a lot of innovation um, under duress during COVID-19. We saw Gavi established, we saw the rising role of the African Union and the Africa Center for Disease Control, which really played a remarkable role as a technical support agency through the PABM. But you know, Africa's a very big place. <laughs> Um, and the fact is that um, if you look at where the public sector has a presence as government, uh, I would guess that geographically about 20% of the African continent does not fall under any kind of state control. And so, so you need to deal with this big continent, but there's been major innovations. And I think um, in, in, in much of the COVID-19 response, Many African governments did extremely well under very difficult circumstances. The, what worries me is that uh, people have been mesmerized by mRNA, which I mean, it is mesmerizing <laughs> from a technological and science point of view. Um, and it's easy to make promises and commitments, but to have a sustainable operation on vaccine development requires a sustained investment in R&D, in your science community, in the translation science of that, with people with the pharma skills to make vaccines and all the other ingredients going along. And in my view, um, and I'm going to turn to Laura to comment on this. South Africa has, and many countries right now are busy, but it's important to get three or four vaccine hubs to be successful and not to have a dissipated effort. Uh, that would require coordination. So um, um, I'd like a comment on the capacity in Africa for coordination. I think there is capacity, um, but it is a big place. So we need uh, regional, um, by regional, I mean sort of sub-regional capability to coordinate matters. Everybody should not be making the same vaccines, for example. There has to be some kind of division of labor and so on. We think that South Africa and Senegal have the most promise initially, but uh, there are a number of other, other countries with great promise too. So from, I don't want to be in videos about it, but um, all the current countries that are involved in vaccine manufacturing, um, uh, from Kenya to Morocco, to Egypt, to Tunisia, to Ghana, to Nigeria, uh, to Rwanda, 
and I don't want to leave anybody out, but I think uh, Botswana as well. So, um, and so the question is, from the WEF's perspective, which which works with industry, what what is the main points that you want to make about success, and should we not be concentrating on finding four or five initiatives that can actually succeed rather than dissipating the effort? Yeah, thank you so much for that wonderful question and really kind of couching it within within that broader broader need for a, almost an ecosystem approach there. Um, you know, I, I think first to say it's it's um it's not necessarily the formed role or necessarily um it, it would be it was quite um contentious to have to be picking um, to be choosing favorites to be picking you know who should succeed who's you know which different companies what different companies should really be at the you know at the forefront so I think it's really a region or a um, a regional approach's responsibility to you know think through themselves to define you know how do they want to self determine to self organize what does that look like and there can be kind of a, a broader a broader approach, and what we saw what we saw happen in during COVID is that the country level, apart from a few select countries like the U.S., China, Indonesia, India, you know, they had the scale to be able to service themselves um, and to be able to um, to be able to ensure that their populations received received vaccine vaccines at the global and meanwhile at the global level there was global systems that. You know, lacked that political leverage to make those rapid decisions that needed to happen um, to counteract the self-interest that drove decision making. So, kind of to counter that, what we see with the African Union and Pavlum and Pavlum's establishment is this third option of regions, which is gaining really unprecedented support, and it really does offer this opportunity for strategic autonomy and self-reliance, which is anchored in distributed, regionally based manufacturing ecosystems. And what the regions offer is the ability to scale, which individual countries, as mentioned, struggle to do. Um, they enable, they offer speed, which the global systems can't. And they also, um, I think, um, I'm Dr. Hotez, it was you who mentioned that it's important for the focus of how regions can determine what are the vaccines, that they want to focus on, what is their particular disease burden, how do they want to target their technologies for their region. And then at that strategic level, they're able to ensure more equitable access and pandemic resilience. So what we've been doing at the forum and the uh, regionalized vaccine manufacturing collaborative that I mentioned is, you know, thinking through what does this ecosystem approach look like? What are the necessary components to ensure vaccine manufacturing is sustained during both peacetime and then able to surge? And, um, and we have identified seven pillars, which include business models, market shaping, public private financing, manufacturing, innovation, tech transfer workforce, supply chain, and last but not least, uh, regulatory and governance. And you know, we really see these as the mission critical elements to enable an ecosystem approach and support end-to-end -end manufacturing. And, um, and that it's, it's um, you know, these can complement what already works and, you know, global systems that are functioning. We don't want to dismantle, you know, we don't want to dismantle effective, effective systems and markets. However, there is this opportunity, um, Professor Wilmot, as you are saying, for, um, for public-private partnerships to emerge and for coalitions of countries to come together to form regions and to have that self-determination to identify themselves, you know, what are the manufacturing initiatives that should rise to the forefront? What do they look like? And how can we avoid duplication? And just a, a, quick, um, a quick example, and then I'll wrap up, is kind of looking at this is kind of a funny one, but looking at post-World War II Europe steel, the steel market, um, countries came together regionally to think about, you know, how can they have a sustainable end-to-end -end manufacturing for that particular commodity to avoid the duplication 
what were the mapping of supply chains? How could they ensure quality, um, quality insurance and regulatory system? And that was really the first time that those countries came together as a region around a single product, steel in that case. What we're seeing here now is countries coming together around a single product, which are vaccines and laying the groundwork for what a regional collaboration could look like. And in that case, that really laid the foundation for you know, EU and a, a trade block there. And I think that's what's really exciting about vaccines here is how can seeing these different countries coming together around a single product, how can that lead to kind of uh, creating the pathway and blazing a trail for future commodities as well? Thank you very much, Laura. So, so to say that, the, just to list them again, the countries involved in vaccine manufacturing uh, or aspects are in Africa, Algeria, Botswana, Egypt, uh, Ghana, uh, Kenya, Morocco, Nigeria, Rwanda, Senegal, South Africa, and Tunisia. I hope I haven't left anybody out. The African Medicines uh, and, and Rwanda as well, but the African Medicines Association, which is the continental regulatory agency, uh, which would be supported by national ones as well, is run out of Kigali, Rwanda. Uh, then there is the, the, uh, the mRNA tech, uh, tech transfer uh, um, um, enterprise that's run by the WHO, or steered and led, led by the WHO, which has a hub and spoke model. Um, so, so there's a lot going on. I just uh, well, wanted- can I, can, I, can I make a comment about mRNA? Because I know everyone is kind of running to the mRNA like a, like a little kid's soccer game or football game, yeah. you know, where the ball goes off in one direction and everyone runs towards it and right. nobody nice, stays nice, behind. And, nice metaphor, Peter. Yeah. And, so, and, well, having spent too much time on my kids in soccer fields so, of uh, the unofficial expert. So, I mean, I think, you know, one of the, one of the issues that we have to keep in mind is we still have this, the mRNA technology is still untested because, you know, pretty much any way you delivered the spike protein induced a protective uh, immune response. And, and all, te all vaccine technologies, including mRNA, have strengths and they have weaknesses. In the case of mRNA, you can make a piece of mRNA very quickly and go into a country potentially and help stabilize the system. But we've seen that the durability of protection is not very robust. And, and it may be that mRNA turns out to be a technology that's used to go in very quickly into a situation, um, take care of things for the first six months until a more long lasting vaccine technology is put in place. So we, we have around six of them, right? We have the mRNA, we have the particle vaccines like Novavax, we have recombinant protein vaccines like ours. You have uh, um, on, on top of that, the adenovirus vectored platform. And very importantly that people tend to forget about was the VSV, the vesicular stomatitis virus platform that was so important for taking care of things in the DR Congo in, in uh, pre-pandemic for, for Ebola. That was an extraordinary technology, single dose, highly protective. We have to find a way to keep all of those technologies in play because for any given pathogen, you don't know which one is going to be the most successful. So people, so, you know, the criticism might come, well, uh, Wilma, you just mentioned about almost a dozen African countries. Do we really need that? Well, the answer is you might, because if you're talking about six different technologies, really six very different products, and it may be that we're going to need that level of um, those numbers to generate the kind of diversity that we need. Yeah, I, I entirely agree. I think that's uh, that's right. I think that um, some countries might be front runners in terms of developing uh, new technologies, but we need the entire architecture um, if it makes uh, makes sense. Um, I mean, pandemics are pandemics because they always bring a surprise, right? <laughs> um, and how you deal with that surprise, um, you can prepare for it up to a point, but you can't really anticipate a development of a vaccine if you don't know the nature and characteristics of the pathogen that is uh, causing that. So well, thank you very much for those comments. I wanted to... Um... Well, well, Matt, can I, yeah. can I come in with a very brief comment just to, uh, of course. Go to ahead. reinforce what both uh, Laura and, and, and Peter are saying? Um, and, and in fact, we had this conversation on a call um, that Laura hosted earlier today. 
uh, th there's no doubt that uh, mRNA is not the single silver bullet here, right? We need to accept that. So, so some of the numbers we need to look at closely is the current uh, full finish capacity on the African continent is around 1.8 billion. It will become 2 billion doses shortly. And uh, the current demand um, is around 1.2, 1.3 billion doses. Wilmot, as you said, it will grow to around 2.4 billion doses. There or thereabouts, we estimate, by 2040. So striking the balance between having the correct mix of both antigens and technology platforms on the one hand and not overloading your capacity on the other, i.e. the sustainability conversation again, um, achieving that balance is is critical. And, and I, I'm afraid we do sort of get spellbound by certain things like mRNAs, et cetera. But we, we've got to acknowledge that there's a place for multiple platforms and multiple technologies here. And I think if we miss Peter's point, uh, it's, it's tantamount to um, what we experience with no demand or little demand and unsustainable facilities. So I, I think we need to uh, blow this up and amplify this point far and wide so we don't run into problems down the line. It's, it's absolutely critical, the point that Peter's made. And Laura made that point earlier today in a, in a WEF, on a WEF call. And we really need to amplify that message far and wide. Thank you. Yeah, just to fully agree with you, Stavros, and, and Dr. Hotez said, it's really just a tool in the toolbox. And while it's a very important tool and it has you know, extreme potential for addressing, you know, pivoting in many different ways to address many different disease areas, um, it exists within the broader ecosystem of supply and demand, which you very um, pointedly gave your point, Aspen's experience for Stavros. And, you know, how can we not only ensure that there's a diversified portfolio of vaccines that are being developed for any particular region? So that region, um, I think it was your comment, Stavros, kind of uh, local, what was it? Um, local solutions, local pass capacities to serve local problems. So can we ensure that, you know, there's this portfolio of vaccines that are there and ready to serve the local population and mRNA being one of them and um, really ensuring that it's embedded within uh, a supportive network with um, public support, private support, um, and, that yeah, and that sustained public support too, that um, Dr. Hotez, you mentioned, that goes beyond just the, the rotating door of, of politicians as well. Right. And I think, you know, Laura, the, the point that that you'll be responsible for at the World Economic Forum is convincing global leaders that this is worth paying for. This is not going to be cheap. Mm -hmm. But but you know, you make the case that we have to make the case that look, we've seen in COVID-19 that as devastating as the public health impact was for COVID-19, that was just the beginning. It this destroyed global economies. It created global insecurity on an unprecedented level, and and pandemic and pandemic threats are at, at least as important as as Putin and Russia invading Ukraine. And 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 of course, governments are prepared to invest billions of dollars in defense armaments and and that sort of thing. We have to somehow make the case to them that that equivalent investments in combating pandemics, which include vaccines, is going to be critical and, and easier said than done, right? Even, even though I think nobody would doubt that now after COVID-19, the problem is memory fades pretty quickly. And, and, and now that the U.S. White House is, says the emergency is over, I think people are going to forget about covid fairly quickly. And so keeping that on the radar screen is, is going to be very critical for, for the World Economic Forum and other, and, or G20 summits or other, you know, international convening uh, uh, organizations, the Munich Security Conference, you've got to keep pandemic threats uh, on, at, at the top of, or near the top of the list. Yeah. And yeah. that's, um, oh, sorry. Go, um, no, go, go ahead. Please yeah. Go. And and that's really what we're trying to do um, and Stavros is part of and many others is how can um, 
we kind of bring together the different regions and as that platform kind of have that voice, that consistent pestering voice to, to um, and connection that link up to that global forum, to the G7, to the G20, um, to those international funding institutions and the private institu funding institutions as well. And how can we identify what are some common challenges, some common opportunities across the different regions and you know what are what are we seeing in Africa what are we seeing in Latin America ASEAN and what are maybe some you know opportunities for investment as well can we surface them and provide them with visibility as well so um, to your point it's it's about kind of bringing together um, all these disparate actors and to see how can we access um, sustainable support and in addition to that, it's interesting too, as we saw during the pandemic and you rightly pointed out, it affected all areas of, of society. Um, how can, what's interesting to me, and I kind of touched upon it before as well with that, you know, using vaccine as a, as a test a test case, you know, how can we use this, um, you know, the formation of, of PAVM and kind of um, the African Medicines Agency and, you know, identifying how a region can be structured, how can we use that vac the vaccine test case to bring in other potentially interested sectors as well, ministers of finance, industry, um, you know, how this might be interesting for them. And we do see it in some countries as they kind of are connecting that with kind of the broader implications of uh, free trade associations and whatnot. So um, I think there's a lot of untapped avenues we can go down and we kind of have to work together to figure out how we can link up to them. Yeah. And so obviously universities have a major role to play. The pandemic center at Brown is one illustration. We've been in existence for a year. Uh, other universities, of course, are keeping this on the agenda as well. So it's really quite important uh, because beyond vaccine manufacturing, we need to do two other things. We need to train a, a global cater of highly trained health professionals uh, across the globe, and we need to upscale surveillance and biodetection. I have a question from, um, from the audience, um, and I'm going to pose a question to all three panelists, and uh, could they also then just make any closing remarks just very briefly? We only have five, uh, seven minutes left, so, um, so uh, just a bullet uh, conclusion points uh, from you, but this is the question coming from uh, Ram Invest, uh, and it reads, given Kenya's recent ranking as a top candidate for vaccine manufacturing globally by the Lancet Medical Journal, what specific strategies and partnership can be put in place to support and scale up local vaccine production in Kenya while ensuring equitable access to vaccines across the African continent? We've addressed many of these questions. Let me just uh, also say that there's a new malaria vaccine that was recently approved in Ghana for the first time in the world. And if in your conclusion, focus on the issue of vaccine take up, vaccine confidence. Um, we know the role of disinformation in terms of compromising it. Uh, vaccination rates are actually down in the world globally, including in Africa. If you look at what's happening with HPV. So that's the question. And if our speakers can give us a rapid response in terms of any concluding point they'd like to make. Uh, and let's start with you, Peter. Yeah, uh, two parts to that question. So first, capacity for a place such as Ghana, and, and very important question. And and I think the key here is recognize it's the human capital that we need to build for training. So that means you can build the most amazing vaccine production facility um, ever invented, and it won't work. You'll still need that human capital training. And this is going to be very important for the universities, I think, to build vaccine training hubs. Um, you know, the part of the, and we do a lot of capacity building and training for vaccine development because, you know, it turns out you can't walk in, you cannot walk into GSK or Pfizer or Moderna and say, teach me how to make a vaccine. And 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 you can do that with us, but we're we're you know we're we need more of that. So, building university-based vaccine development programs, both at master's level, even some PhD level, because it's different from a biochemistry PhD or a microbiology PhD. You need to learn how to do the um, uh, 
batch production records. You need to know how to do the documentation under a quality umbrella, and and that is severely lacking globally, not only in not only in Africa. I think the second point is you know and. And, and, and Wilmot, we've talked about this as since I'm public enemy n- or more, number one or two with the anti-vaccine groups. You know, I, I've watched firsthand of how these organizations have evolved from or devolved from phony baloney around autism to becoming politically motivated enterprises. And I've written now about how this U.S. style anti-vaccine ecosystem is spreading globally. And it's going to halt the introduction of malaria vaccines, of new RSV vaccines. I had the opportunity to meet with Dr. Tedros in Geneva towards the end of last year to brief him on this. I think this is going to be one of our great challenges that um, this is uh, this is a monster now of, of epic proportions. Thanks very much, Peter. Uh, Stavros, a minute. Yeah, in in the 30 seconds to make two points, uh, right? Uh, The first is, uh, let me reinforce uh, again, uh, local capacity solve local problems. I think we've got to keep reminding ourselves of that. And secondly, when uh, when we talk about reforming both domestic, continental and global procurement um, for vaccines, the edgy question of who picks up any premium if there is a premium always becomes a stumbling block and the simple answer to that is uh, we we need to procure on the basis of what constitutes best value for money not what constitutes the cheapest product because you can uh, you, you can save a dollar on a vaccine but lose three dollars in economic activity back into your own economy and in that instance, that's a poor it's a, that's a poor procurement decision because you've actually lost two dollars to the fiscus. So we need that type of approach in moving forward, and hopefully that's what will be considered by the various procurement agencies as we move ahead in the in the coming months and years. Thanks very much. It's been a great pleasure to be part of this. Yeah, thank you. You ended on a fundamentally important point. So uh, Laura. Rapids, one minute, please. Yeah, no, a quick summary. I think everybody brought up excellent points. Um, uh, Dr. Hotez, to your point, I think the, the workforce element is massive. And I think there's so much talent and so, so many great um, graduate programs. And one of the consistent ch- consistent um, challenges that we've heard is how, you know, how can we ensure employment for those people afterwards? So how can we build that corresponding industry? and link it very, very um, purposefully to that workforce as it's emerging to maintain them there. And how can we then subsidize the industry to ensure that it will um, continue and it will persist? And that, as you said, Stavros, is linked to the procurement agencies. And how can we uh, convince governments that there is a premium that needs to be paid for the, um, for the establishment of of um, manufacturing. And I think India is a great case of example that invested early on in the eighties and has thousands of times over reaped the benefits of that investment in their, in their, um, in their industry from, um, which is now I think a $170 billion industry as of 2025. So I think there's great examples and there's a lot of proof out there that, you know, this is a worthwhile investment. And I think it's, um, to make the continuing to make the case and ensuring that it doesn't fall off the radar. Oh, but many thanks, uh, Laura, for that comment. Uh, colleagues, so this brings our session to a close. Let me just say that uh, last year, Sir Jeremy Farrar, who is now the Chief Scientific Officer for the WHO, and I convene a panel of experts to produce a report for the South African government um, on vaccine manufacturing. And we have um, released that report this week. You will find it on the Wits University website. You'll find it on the Brown University website and also can be downloaded from Daily Maverick who served as our partner in, uh, in the seminar. The VACTAS report made uh, the headline recommendations is to that vaccine procurement should be de-risk uh, for local industry and scale up a continent, for a continental market, that there has to be major investments in human resource and skills development, 
that the regulatory environment should promote, in this case, South Africa's biotech and vaccine ecosystem. And finally, to upscale R&D infrastructureization industries. I recommend that you, that you read that report. Uh, let me just thank our panelists, our fabulous panelists, and everyone who joined us today for this uh, discussion. Uh, if you'd like to share this event with anybody who was unable to attend, the recording will be posted on our website, the Brown University website, next week. Please follow us on Twitter to learn about all of our events and future webinars. Uh, please reach out to the email address on the screen uh, with any questions or suggestions for future webinars in our Pandemics and Society series. series. Uh, let me finally thank uh, my um, or our team at um, at uh, Brown for, for for running the seminar. Uh, Bente Holt, Leigh Lovgren, Andrea Ulik, uh, and Aquel Person. And with that, uh, please enjoy the rest of your afternoon or evening, wherever you may, may be. Many thanks for joining us today. Uh, goodbye. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Professor. All the best. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.